Third Eye, being an investor, and then Chef Robotics. I was like 16, 17 years old, and there's people in Brazil and Argentina and China who are using this product. A few angel investors were like, why don't you turn this into a company? What exactly are these robots doing? So we're each robot's kind of doing the work of two people. Robots don't fail, they don't slow down, they just like go. Those are the two things that kind of got me excited. It's a big market, it feels like there's a big pain point. And I guess one more thing, which is like- Advice would you give to people like starting something? The passion hypothesis says that passion leads to success. You look inwards and you're like, what am I passionate about? But the truth is that like, Hello everyone, today we have Rajat Bagheria on my show. He's the founder and CEO of Chef Robotics. Rajat, I'm so excited to have you on the show. How are you doing today? I'm good and thank you, Mana, for having me. I'm excited. Thank you. I want to ask you many questions about Chef Robotics, but I really want to like ask about you first. Like, can you give us a little intro about yourself, starting Third Eye, then moving on to being an investor and then starting Chef Robotics? Like, how has been the last decade of your life been? That's a, it's a broad question. That was a big question. Yeah, I guess. So I, I went to like high school and a lot of my kind of like schooling was in Cincinnati, Ohio. Basically during school, I mean, in high school, I was very focused on kind of like, okay, like my, my number one goal is I wanted to go to a good school. So I was like, I worked really hard to get into a good school. And then kind of like when I got accepted, I was like, okay, fine. Like I basically last like five years, I was super focused on that goal. And I was like, okay, now I'm free. I can like do whatever I, I want. And that's really when like entrepreneurship really started. So kind of my senior year of high school, I worked on a few different projects. One was called Cafe Mocha, which is basically this like, at the time medium really didn't exist very much. Much. So there's like Tumblr, there's these different like blogs, like WordPress blogs that people are doing. But I was like, okay, well, I like to write. And it, there wasn't really a good platform for young writers to publish their writing or their research or their poetry or what, what have you with the world. So this is really where I learned how to do software engineering and then actually like ship this thing. And at the time I, went, I was like 16, 17 years old in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, like suburban Ohio. I was like, wow, like there's people in like Brazil and Argentina and like China who are using this product. And it's pretty cool. And so this is a like relatively formative experience for, for me as a young person. But that was kind of my first kind of real entrepreneurial endeavor. You know, then my first, my goal during college, my like basically freshman year of college, my goal was to find a co-founder for Cafe Mocha, the social networking for website for young writers. Um, that was my goal. And so like I, would, I was doing computer science at the time and, you know, I was like, okay, who is the best kind of engineer here, right? And um, I found some really great people that kind of became very close friends. And interestingly, what, what happened is that we entered this hackathon, Penups. And, and at the time, like AlexNet had just happened and computer vision had just kind of, like it felt like it was having its stride again with deep learning, CNNs. So we were like, okay, well, why don't we take that idea? We come Combine it with like smart glasses. The Google Glass was having its heyday at the time as well. And what if we build like a product for the visually impaired for this hackathon, just for the hackathon? How are you helping the visually impaired though with the glasses? Yeah. So the idea basically was that. So it's funny. Like there's three of us, and one of our um, my co-founder at the time's grandfather's was visually impaired. So that was kind of like where we knew about the problem, I guess. But but basically the idea was that you know the visually impaired kind of have this idea of like learned helplessness, right? Like you kind of go through life and you, you kind of constantly need help. And I think our idea was like if we could provide them a product that they could put onto their face, like smart glasses and they could use a verbal signal like okay glass recognize this or something like this um, and then we could take a picture a video stream and then do you know real-time object recognition and detection then we could tell the person verbally hey you're looking at ibuprofen versus advil or it's a one dollar bill or, or five dollar bill or here's what the menu says at the restaurant that's such a good idea yeah we honestly it was like a very simple idea you know honestly we didn't know much about computer vision or anything at the time we were like two weeks into to college right but we ended up doing really well at this hackathon we just hacked our way through this and we did really well and at the end of it a few angel investors we're like, oh, why don't you turn this into a company? And we were like, okay, like, wh why not? What do we have to lose? So we decided to kind of do this. This is what became Third Eye. And, you know, a lot of my kind of college experiences was Third Eye, right? And we worked on this for around three and a half years. Ultimately, it became a decision of do we, like, drop out and do this full time? Or do we kind of sell the company? And for various reasons, I decided to sell the company. So you must have learned a lot about, like, uh, image recognition, machine learning yeah. during that process as well, right? I, I think exactly. And, and I think that that's exactly right, which is, like, that was my first experience really with AI, right? And I became really excited about this prospect of AI. You know, this was like 2018, 2019 type of time frame. So anyways, but for me personally, I was like, okay, like this thing seems exciting. And it, it and it basically was like, okay, like I had a few things that I was thinking about next. I was like, okay, like, first of all, I want to like really learn how to build companies um, from basically like a mentor, right? Somebody more senior. And then the second thing was like, okay, what's the next thing I want to do? So I tried to do a parallel process with these, both these things. So from, in terms of like learning, I convinced Slava Rubin, who's the founder of Indiegogo, he was giving this talk at Wharton. I was like, hey, like, you know, this is who I am. I did this thing with Third Eye. He was launching this new 
new like equity crowdfunding product for Indiegogo. He, he runs Indiegogo. So he's launching this new product for equity crowdfunding. And I was like, well, like I'm, I'm guessing you need help with deal flow. What if I help you build like some new vehicle to get deal flow using a bunch of scouts all over the country as founders, basically. So I was like, basically create my own, create, try to convince him to create my own job with him. And I was like, okay, well in return, can I just follow you around and attend the meetings you attend and, and, and things like that? So he, he did say yes. So basically that like, that was a really awesome experience because like for a few months, I just followed Slala around and like went to all his meetings and like, you know, he's thinking about like acquiring companies and like I was helping with the model and like helping make slides for board presentations, like a bunch of like pretty like intense stuff that as a young person, I probably shouldn't have access to, but he became like a really great mentor. So that was like during the day. And then the evenings, of course, I was like thinking a lot about, okay, what do I do next? And I became really excited about like essentially two ideas. One was AI, of course, just continuing AI. And then the second was energy. It, it feels like those two are things in, in various breaths and scopes are the, the two big things that are going to affect our lives. Of course, m just given the third eye experience, I was more excited about AI. I was like, okay, what, what's the right product and company to build? So then I really took a deep dive into the market, right? Like who are the customers for this? And I, I became excited about this idea of like AI in the physical world. And, and what I mean by this is like at the time, like the AI companies that existed were like people who were doing machine learning for like spam detection, spam filtering and stuff for like Netflix recommending you content. It was mostly in a cloud, all software based. And I was like, okay, well, I think there's something exciting about AI in the physical world because like 90% plus of GDP is in the physical world. Like Tesla's figure robot, humanoid robots. Yeah. What else is an example of that? Well, I think I, 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 I think like my thinking was, okay, like what are the foundational industries that represent most of GDP? It's the, it's the labor market, which is half of GDP. Like retail jobs, nursing, uh, hospitals. Yes. Yeah, transportation, construction, even things like mining. I mean, these industries are just so gigantic. I was like, okay, well, what's the biggest part of the physical world? Well, it's the labor market. So then I was like, okay, well, like I want to do something in the labor market, which obviously takes the form of robots, right? AI enabled robots, right? But again, didn't exactly know what the right industry was. And so this is when I kind of the impetus for the fund happened. So another very close friend of mine, Nandit, um, you know, while I was doing like third eye and startups in college, he convinced a bunch of really great LA funds, LA based funds to essentially do the same thing I did with Slava, essentially take him on as essentially like, I'll do whatever, whatever you need me to do, which of, of course was a lot of like, you know, helping with getting deals over the line, but also like fund operations. He did like whatever it took basically. I can tell you enjoyed that experience yeah. a lot. Yes. Like the investing and looking at deals. Yes. So we decided to kind of say, okay, well, why don't we do something together? We, we became close friends and we launched Prototype Capital. And the, the idea was like, it seems to be the case that there's going to be this big influx of companies who are using AI in the physical world or even IoT or ML. So let's go after them. But to go after them, they don't just exist in the Bay Area or LA or New York. Those companies are like everywhere else. They're in like Cincinnati and Idaho and Atlanta and all these other cities in the US um, and, and around the world. So, you know, Silicon Valley VCs are not looking for those companies. So how do we get access? To them. The way that we can get access to them is by finding out who the fan founders hang out with for fun. Well, and, and the truth is most founders hang out with other founders for fun. So if, if I want to get after like a really great company in, in Atlanta for insurance tech, let's say hypothetically, then if I can find that founder's friends and convince them to be a scout with us and I give them carried interest if they refer us great deals, deals that we invest in, then hopefully we can get some really great under the radar deal flow. Yeah, so this is kind of what we did. So we had around 70 different kind of founders all over the country. And, and yeah, we, we, we basically invested a bunch of different companies. But but from the chef perspective, it also kind of got me in front of some of these potential customers. It got me in front of potential customers in construction and agriculture and food and all these different industries. And of course, I ended up focusing on food. I, I always knew that like I wanted to like, like the whole idea for Prototype was like founders investing in other founders. My, me personally, I really like building. I never wanted to become full-time VC, at least in the short term, a medium term, I guess. You're too young for that. Yeah. I really wanted to build stuff and I was like, okay, Prototype is going to be a thing I always do, but like I want the the full-time thing mostly to be building. So so yeah, anyways, like I, 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 the food industry was very exciting. And the reason it was very exciting is because few kind of macro trends. One macro trend was just the size of the industry. You know, I, I learned just looking at data, I was spending a lot of time, like once I selected, you know, there seems to be something in food, I looked at a lot of data about what's the size of the industry. What I learned is that the biggest industry on planet, uh, sorry, in the US is kind of nursing and personal aids. The second one's kind of retail salespeople. And the, the third one is food preparation, food service, food production. My perception was that the first two are not tractable by AI anytime soon. Soon. So it felt like number three is actually arguably the biggest market tractable for AI. Just given this idea that the proxy for market size of AI is the number of humans who do that job. So I said, okay, well, it seems like there's a really big industry. And, and then I was like, okay, is there a big problem? Because of course in startups, you need to be solving a problem. So with that, again, I took like an anecdotal approach as well as like, let's look at the data approach. Anecdotally, I talked to food truck operators, to fast casual operators, to airline catering, to ghost kitchens, manufacturing, anyone and everybody. They all said basically my number one problem is big labor shortage. It's like on a 
given day, I don't know which 80% of my people are gonna come to work. And because of that, I'm leaving revenue on the table. So it felt like there's a big light from anecdotally, it felt like there's a big pain point. And then I confirmed with the data that the BLS in 23, 2023 reported that the food industry is actually the number one labor shortage in the US. More than like retail, more than manufacturing. And this is combining assembly, pr food preparation. Every, it's just like a food industry basically. Okay. So it's like, basically that's, those are the two things that kind of got me excited. Okay, it's a big market, Feel, feels like there's a big pain point. I, and I guess one more thing, which is like, you know, it felt like the status quo AI robots could kind of scoop food and make a Chipotle bowl or a sweet green bowl. Like it felt like that's like something I can imagine. So technically, of course, we hadn't done a ton of homework at the time, but it felt like the puzzle pieces came together and that's why we decided to kind of focus on broad scopes that industry. So can you talk a little bit about like the, what exactly are, are these robots doing? Because the hardest thing in my opinion is like food is so, it's hard to manipulate food, right? Because it's so complex. Yeah, so today like our go-to-market is really food manufacturing. So, um, which is different than a lot of people think. A lot of people are like, ah, robots for restaurants, right? But like like you alluded to, we are actually focused on manufacturing. You know, essentially the way you can think about it is anytime you have kind of a meal that you might have in an airplane, or like if you get frozen meals from the grocery store, or you go to the grocery store and in the deli section, the fresh food section, all those prepared salads you might find at Trader Joe's, all these like kinds of meals are actually made by people. And they're made by people in these big facilities, basically food factories. And the way it kind of works is you have these long assembly lines and on the assembly line, there's like 12 people and each person has a big tub and they're kind of scooping trays, scooping food into trays or burritos or wraps or sandwiches. The most mundane task, humans should not be doing that. There's no future where humans are going to do this. It's just not going to be a thing, right? So, so today that's what we focus on, right? So um, we focus on the food assembly, which, which means it kind of like, you know, like you have to scoop food from a big hotel tub and you have to not crush it. You have to work with any portion size. The customer wants 53 grams of shredded chicken. You do 53 grams. You got to be consistent. Then you have to detect and track and place the carrots into whatever compartment the customer wants, but also spread it the way the customer wants. And, and of course, you have to do this in a way that's scalable so that you're not making custom software, custom hardware per ingredient or per tray or per customer, but rather it's really an AI-driven, more flexible solution. All right, let's talk business. So average assembly line worker would, I don't know, would make 50, 60K, yeah. like something around that a year. So how do you price for your services? Is it like a yearly subscription? Yeah, so we'll charge, we'll charge a yearly recurring fee. And that's of course, less than human. So we're each robot's kind of doing the work of two people. And of course, again, nobody's being fired, right? They're, those people are going to do a different task. It's probably better to do that other task, which is less redundant. And so yeah, like our business models, we're gonna we're gonna charge them a small kind of implementation fee. We call it like an NRE, non-recurring expense. And that's mostly just for like the initial configuration, installation. Like we're gonna have a couple apps engin applications engineers who fly out and deploy the thing and train the team, things like that. But there's no big capex up front, right? So they, they basically say, okay, look, you're gonna pay a small non-recurring recurring expense. And then once that's done, you're going to pay us a yearly recurring fee. That yearly recurring fee is going to be less than the cost of your people, those two people. And then the ROI for them is really like, you know, yes, chef is cheaper, but that's honestly like number five on the list. The, the biggest ROIs are really like, you have to remember there's a big labor shortage. The other thing is that like, they often can't run all their lines. So if they have 10 lines, they can only run seven because they just don't have people. They don't have a supply of labor to meet the demand from customers. So they, they're under, they're underproducing. So if we can say, okay, well, line eight over there, why don't you put these eight robots and line eight can run now. That's a ton of money for you, right? So increasing revenue is something we think a lot about. Oftentimes we can help increase throughput, average throughput. Robots don't fail, they don't slow down, they just like go. Whereas like six hours into the shift, humans, they get tired. So chef can usually increase average throughput, which is again, a lot of revenue. We, we usually think, like, I think the best businesses are businesses that increase revenue more than save cost. So we, we help with that. And then we also help with like yield. Like we, we, we like waste less food. So what's next for chef robotics? Like, are you guys gonna be raising another round? What what are you going to be focusing on for the next, like, let's say a year or two? Let's see. So there's a few things that are top of mind. So one thing that's really exciting about Chef is we have a really good set of like existing customers that are quite big customers. I mean, these guys have like lots of different plans all over the world. And so really landing and, landing and expanding, which is a lot of customer success um, and really like just essentially living with them, like really making the product extremely good for them. Obviously, there's a lot of product and engineering work to do that. But we really spend a lot of time on that because we think that if a customer buys two robots, that's not that impressive. But if that same customer buys 50 robots, that's extremely extremely impressive because they're not going to buy 50 unless the thing really works. But of course, we have to really make it work then, right? And that's the sweet, sweet recurring revenue <laughs> per robot yeah, exactly. per year. So it's yeah. it's good for your company. It's good for the business as well. So yeah, kind of scaling within current customers. Now we're at a point, we obviously kind of announced what we do recently. And now we're at a kind of a point where we do want to scale go to market and sales and marketing. Honestly, we've been very quiet. I mean, as you've probably seen, we've been very quiet. And and re the reason we've been very quiet is like, you know, we, we felt like we had something, we're onto something. And, you know, we're so focused on current customers, like getting more sales folks or market 
marketing folks wouldn't really do much. We, we can't even handle the demand, right? But now we can. Now, like, like we feel like the product's ready to scale and we have the team to execute against it. So it's like, okay, like really scale and go to market. So that's like getting net new customers. And then I would say number three is really kind of continue to really invest heavily in AI. So we have this like dedicated AI team now who, who are kind of using imitation learning and learning from demonstration and also decision transformers to kind of say, okay, well, let's use production data. Let's combine it with like imitation learning to learn new SKUs, new products, new ingredients. And let's try to get, build like more of a generalized food manipulation model. So what I've observed from like researching you, talk, like talking to you, you are really good at picking the right problem. And I feel like a lot of people like myself included, like have been like unintentional with a few like ventures. So what advice would you give to people like when, when before they're starting something? What should we decide to focus our time on? This is a, obviously, there's a big can of worms here, right? I think broadly, there's like two different schools of thought I've heard that I've that I kind of like think about. It's like one school of thought is this passion hypothesis, which is kind of you look inwards and you're like, what am I passionate about? And you do, you do that. I think that can work. And if you're passionate about something done, easy, especially if the, the passion matches up with a big market and like a big opportunity. But the truth is that like, I'm not like before chef or like before prototype. And, like I wasn't inherently passionate about like the visually impaired or food. Like I love robots and AI, but honestly, food is not like, I'm like, I never loved cooking or like yeah so I wasn't deeply passionate about it and like before chef like I wasn't like passionate about really this thing and I think I, a lot of my founder friends are like this it's not like Aaron Levy's super passionate about cloud storage you know you don't wake up and be like or like HR software it's like let's go no like most people are not super passionate about these things right so the passion hypothesis says that like passion leads to success and there's another the hypothesis which is like that the equations kind of the, it's inverse right is uh, it impact it's well it's success if you're successful that leads to passion I tried the passion thing which is like okay like what am I care? What am I? What do I care about? And like, yeah, I, I, I guess I figured out that I, I, I like AI robots. But then I, I did the opposite, which is like, what's the right company I can start that will be successful? How do I increase probability of success? Because as soon as things start to go well, it's very easy to become passionate. Like, if you're really good at something, if you're just winning, then you become passionate. So for me, this took the form of, okay, let me find a really big market. Like, okay, let's look at the data. What, what is the big, biggest market? It's like labor industry. It's like, okay, food is the biggest market tractable. Then it was like, okay, there's a big problem. Then it was like, okay, assemblies are right, go to market not cooking and prepping. Then it was like, okay, manufacturing. Today, if you look at Chef, you're like, why did he end up or we end up in food manufacturing? It's kind of like not sexy. It's kind of boring, right? On the surface. But then if you look at this history, it's like, ah, like today they're building this, but tomorrow they want to build that. It makes sense. So I, I tend to think like, figure out what's going to make you successful and then passion would follow. Well, with that said, I thank you so much for coming on the show. You answered like amazingly. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Manav. I appreciate it.